Today I have a fantastic story for you. In 175 AD, Marcus Aurelius, the king of the Roman Empire, receives a very shocking news. One of his powerful generals and also his friend, Avidius Cassius, has rebelled against Marcus. He's planning to overthrow him as a king. Now most kings when they hear news like that, how do they react? They would immediately issue a death warrant, like they would want his head on a spike, but not Marcus. The way Marcus dealt with the situation makes him one of the greatest emperors of all time, at least in my eyes. The Roman Empire actually lasted for centuries, but there was a time of about 90 years in which there were five good emperors. Marcus was one of them. So Roman Empire was one of the biggest kingdoms of all time. Like its territories ran through Europe, North Africa and the Middle East. There was actually a time where about one-fifth of the world's population was under Roman Kingdom. Marcus Aurelius became the king in 161 AD. Now of course to manage such a big empire, you need really powerful and many great generals, right? Many great commanders. Avidius Cassius was one of them. So Cassius was this talented, super ambitious man who rose to power very quickly under the Roman regime. Like by the age of 34, he was a commander. And then two years after that, he was appointed the governor of Syria. And about four years after that, he was declared the supreme commander of the Orient. That is, the eastern provinces of the Roman Empire were under his control. That's actually a lot of power. So in 175 AD, Cassius was at an all-time high in his power. Then something dramatic happens. Cassius receives a false report that Marcus has died of some illness. Now Cassius thinks of this as a great opportunity for himself. He thought of a chance to now become the king himself. Like he was already close to being a king, handling so many provinces. He thought it was now his time to become the Roman emperor. Such a chance would never appear again because the king is gone, at least according to his reports. And now if he waits too long, then maybe his son would grow up and he'll become the king. So he has to act right now. He was confident that he could do it because he thought he did have the support of Egypt. So in his area, he started claiming that he was officially selected by the troops of Marcus Aurelius, that he was supposed to be the successor of Marcus. Of course, that was false. So the rebellion has now started. Now the news of this rebellion, of course, finally reaches Marcus. When he first hears about it, he actually tries to cover it up. Like he wants to solve this internally because Cassius was his friend, at least that's what he thought. But such news, such gossip actually spreads like wildfire, faster than every variant of COVID. Soon everybody was talking about it, so Marcus decided to address it in a speech. In this speech, you will see the signs of the greatness of his character for the first time. So first he expresses that he is really sad to hear about the betrayal from a friend. Remember, he said sad, not angry. Like a typical response would be extreme fury from a king. But here he's just saying, he was sad. Then he goes on to say that if it was just between him and me, I would actually leave the decision to the Senate and the army. And if Senate and army, they decide that he is a better ruler, like he will be better than me, I am ready to give up my empire to him. Do you see how extraordinary this is? Like a king who has all the power to just squash all the rebellion. He's actually appealing to merit. He's trying to be rational and he's leaving it to the Senate and army to decide. He can just order them and they'll follow. But no, even in this moment, he's trying to be rational. But of course, this would not work because kings were not chosen on the basis of merit. There was no aptitude test for it. Even the Senate and army would never agree to something like this, nor they did. And Marcus, of course, knew this. So he goes on to say that if Cassius gets caught, I don't want him killed. I don't want him to commit suicide. I want to show mercy. In those times, killings happened for very small mistakes. People killed one another and kings killed people as punishment all the time. But here, Marcus wants to show mercy for one of the biggest crimes that can be committed against a kingdom. This really was something special. Now, of course, very soon, Cassius also got to know that Marcus is alive, but he chose to continue because by this time, the power had gotten to his head and he actually believed that he would become a king, so why stop now? And he had good reasons to believe it because he had the support from Egypt, Syria, Syria, Palestina, Arabia, Petraea, etc. All of this gave him the potential strength of seven legions. Seven legions was a great number. So Cassius sets up his base in Egypt and Cassius 
also makes his daughter marry this guy called Claudius, who was a powerful man. Claudius's father was a consul, and Claudius was also connected to this aristocratic family in Lycia. It was the Licini family. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right, but yeah, Licini family. And there were some reports that Claudius and Cassius, they were like partners in crime in this revolt. But now, despite having so much support and controlling most important parts of the East, his support was still limited because Roman Empire was huge. Like just having seven legions was not enough. Plus, the Senate had now declared him public enemy. So the public sentiment was actually going against him. He failed to gather widespread support for his kingship. Even the noblemen of the time were turning against him. There was this nobleman called Herodes Atticus who sent him a letter with just three words. He had written, you are mad. Like he sounds like Elon Musk, the way he talks on Twitter, saying a lot with very few words. But yeah, Cassius was mad, mad in power. See, all this time, Marcus was just avoiding a full-scale war, but ultimately he had no choice. Very soon, the people in the city of Rome, they were under panic, so he had to do something. So Marcus finally decided to gather all his troops and march towards Egypt to defeat Cassius. Now, since Marcus was the king, the legitimate king, he had way more support than Cassius did. The number of legions that rallied behind Marcus greatly outnumbered what Cassius had. And as Marcus was progressing, the word quickly spread to Egypt, to this new army of Cassius. And there, they started panicking. Now, soldiers kind of knew what was coming. So one of his commanders did the unthinkable. He took it upon himself and he killed Cassius. Now, he probably did it because he realized that if Marcus actually comes here, he would kill us all. Or maybe he just wanted to get into favor with Marcus in advance, like he wanted to be in his good books. Now, whatever the reason was, this guy beheaded Cassius. And you know what he did next? He sent his head to Marcus as a proof, or maybe as a gift. But when Marcus heard the news that his head has arrived, he chose not to even look at it. He asked him to bury it. It's probably because Cassius dying was not a cause of celebration for Marcus. But then a rebellion does not happen with one man, right? Of course, Avidius Cassius had a lot of supporters and he had his family. What about them? Usually a typical king would do what? They would get them all killed or imprisoned for life. But again, here's also where Marcus was radically different. He asked his senate to get reports of his supporters and told them clearly that he does not want them killed. He wanted no bloodshed. He gave them all mercy. Now, what about the family? Marcus ordered the banishment of one of his sons. And what about that daughter and that son-in-law, the partners in crime? He actually put them under protection of some senator from Lycia. Such kind of compassionate decisions were unheard of. So now the question, why was Marcus like this? Was he born very kind, altruistic, empathetic? Maybe, maybe not. But there is one reason he was like this. He was actually a follower of Epictetus. Epictetus was a Stoic philosopher who wrote the book Discourses. Marcus learned a lot about how to live life from Epictetus, his writings, and then he also started writing his own diary. He used to write his diary in Greek so nobody can read it. It was his personal diary. Different language was his password. And of course, later on, those diaries got translated and now the whole world can read them. They're now called meditations. And it is considered to be a pillar in Stoic literature now. So what were those ideas that made him such a great king, a true philosopher king? I'll quickly give you four of them today. First one, expect the worst. When you wake up in the morning, you tell yourself, the people I deal with today would be meddling, ungrateful, arrogant, dishonest, jealous, and surly. And they are like this because they don't know the difference between good and evil. Second, cooperation over revenge. I have seen the beauty of good. We were born to work together like feet, hands, eyes, two rows of teeth, upper and lower. He talked about how it's human nature to focus more on the evil, more on the negative. But it's far better to focus on cooperation. We must fight our instinct to seek revenge. Third, People can't harm you without your will. Here is a famous quote by him. Choose not to be harmed and you won't feel harmed. Don't feel harmed and you haven't been. This basically means that the ultimate gatekeeper of your emotions is your thoughts. If you interpret something as a harm, you will feel harmed. But if you interpret it differently, you will feel differently. And we will soon get to how you can do that. Fourth, let it all go. He wrote in his book, to shrug it all off, to wipe it all clean, every annoyance and distraction and reach utter stillness, child's play. He had practiced his thoughts so much that now he could just shrug off any annoyances or distractions and reach his inner stillness. He could just let things go, wipe it clean as he said. This actually is something that you should be proud of. 
and he was. Nelson Mandela is regarded as one of the best political leaders of all time. He was the president of South Africa from 1994 to 1999. But before that, Nelson Mandela was actually imprisoned wrongfully imprisoned for 27 years of his life. When he came out of the sentence, he actually get back to his work and he quickly rose to power. And he had many opportunities to actually take revenge on people who conspired against him. But Nelson Mandela didn't. He chose to focus on doing good things. He went on to lead the anti-apartheid crusade. And in 1993, he got the Nobel Peace Prize for peacefully destroying the apartheid regime and laying down the foundations for democracy. And an interesting thing is, when Nelson Mandela was in prison, do you know what he used to read? Some sources say that he used to read meditations from Marcus Aurelius. Isn't that amazing? So now I'll give my take on this. I shared the story of Marcus Aurelius to point out a very important fact about your psychology. There are virtually no limits to how much you can forgive others, how much compassion you can show. Even in your life, you must have people who are meddling, ungrateful, arrogant, dishonest, jealous, or surly. You must get disappointments from close people from time to time, right? And when you are disappointed, when you are hurt, you keep it very close to your heart because it's very big for you. You don't want to let go of your resentment also because you think that's the right or fair thing to do, to remember, because how can you let it go? You actually make an effort to sometimes hold on to anger. I must not fall weak. And if someone tells you, let it go, it's not that big of a deal. What do you mean it's not that big of a deal? Do you know what he did? Well, I don't, but I'm pretty sure it was not as big as somebody planning to overthrow your kingdom and maybe killing you in the process. What I want you to remember is, if Marcus can show compassion for Ovidius, who committed one of the biggest crimes you can against a king, you can also show compassion for a friend who did not show up at your birthday party, or your brother who wouldn't return your money. Now, of course, some people have an objection with this. Do we not do anything then? People can do whatever they want and we just don't do anything? That famous movie line. Let me address that. In these learnings, I haven't even talked about what to do externally. That's a different game. This example was for your internal world. How you should think and feel internally. The ultimate goal is, whatever happens in your life, you must remain calm and compassionate internally, unconditionally, and then do externally whatever is needed. And that's exactly what we saw here in this example, right? Marcus did gather his troops. He did leave with them to defeat Cassius. He was prepared to kill Cassius, but he was doing it not out of hate or revenge. He was doing it because it was necessary to do. And that's the key difference. So the same way when someone betrays you or disappoints you, well, you can choose to talk to them. You can try to resolve the conflict. If nothing works, you can choose to distance from them. Or someday you may just cut them off from your life permanently. That's fine. Like, it would differ from situation to situation. But internally, you never have to hate them. You never really have to want to take revenge. You can do all of that with calmness and compassion inside. I know reaching that internal stage is super difficult. That's why I'll highlight three important ideas which can help. First, like Marcus said, expect the worst. Always anticipate that people will do something wrong, something weird, something unusual that you're not prepared for. That people can betray you, disappoint you, annoy you anytime. This is just how life is. People are different. They have different ways of being. They have different desires, different personalities. And at the core, people are pursuing their own selfish motives, which may actually come in conflict with yours. So when you accept this nature of life and this nature of humanity, it stops shocking you anymore. Of course it would happen. Of course people will do crazy things. But brain needs an answer for that. Why is this happening? And that brings us to the second idea, which is at the core when you see any kind of problematic behavior, behind it, it's always some ignorance. People are ignorant. Or to be clear, they are a mix of wisdom and ignorance. People are partly ignorant. Like Marcus said that they don't know good from evil. So many times people just have no idea what's appropriate, what's inappropriate, what's moral, what's immoral. They're often ignorant about how to talk, how to regulate their own emotions, how to negotiate properly. They can show ignorance to your needs and desires, etc. Ignorance comes in many flavors. And the idea to remember here is we all have some amount of ignorance. So again, ignorance in human beings must also be seen as part of life. And finally, why are people ignorant about so many things? Why? In the final analysis, we are all just products of our nature and nurture. We are in a way in a way, victims of our biology and our environment, the way we were born and the way we were raised. So in a way, whatever a person is doing or thinking, they did not choose that intentionally. It was part of their 
destiny, so to say. People are not masters of their fate, they are recipients of it. And this applies to everybody, because whatever anybody does today, it has a cause, and that cause has a cause, usually multiple causes, and those causes have causes. So it's a chain of causation. Where would you ultimately put the blame? Whatever you put the blame on, there is a cause for that. Once you start to see people like that, you naturally become compassionate. So achieve this state of mind, and then with the calm mind you can decide, what do I have to do now externally? One amazing thing about this process is, now when you take your decisions, now when you behave with other people, it will be more rational because you're thinking with a cooler mind. So even in your worst circumstances, remember these two words, calm and firm. Be like Marcus Aurelius. A very important factor in mental peace is that instead of just thinking and thinking internally, you should be able to talk about your frustrations to someone. But sometimes your friends and family can get tired of listening or might not even understand you well. That's why you should talk to a therapist. Your emotions need regular air ventilation. Your thoughts need regular garbage disposal. Like once every week with a trained therapist. At Sri the Life School, we have a team of therapists that you can talk to. Please go to SriTheLifeSchool.com to book your sessions.